Hey guys, D-Mike here for another episode of Pokemon Brilliant Diamond. We crushed Roark's rock-hard spirit in that gym battle thanks to the efforts of Badoo, Bert. And today we are going to get the heck out of here and progress some plot. But first, Barry! I like that the game goes very, like, you know, descriptive with a thud. It's important. It's important. So we're on our way to eventually head to Eterna City, where there's another gym, but we've got quite a few obstacles before we get there. And as Barry confirmed, we can't go north of Orberg because we don't have a bike yet. So we can't disobey traffic laws and blow through red lights. Sorry, so, see, I can totally relate to that. My level of impatience is pretty on par with Barry's level of impatience. I totally get it. So now that we do have Rock Smash, let's go ahead and demonstrate what that looks like for a moment here. It's the only time you're ever gonna see me use Rock Smash in this episode. Actually, I don't know if that's entirely true. It would help if I wouldn't have hit the wrong button already. This is great. The Let's Play is off to an incredible start. Okay, here we go. So when you go to your hidden moves panel of your catch, click what you'd like to do. In a wild Pokemon, in most cases, it'll be a Bidoof. Bidoof was kind of the HM slave of this generation, and I would love to be able to hit the right button, and we'll come and smash some rocks for you. Now, you can head north in that cave, but we're going to hold off on that, because it's best served once you actually do get a bike. That's another location that is preferable in that way. So we will hold off for now until we actually can do things the right way. And instead we will hop, skip, and jump through Jubilife City. And I do believe that I forgot to grab something in one of these buildings. So we're going to see if it's here. I've seen other people have it and it's made me very jealous. Here is exactly what I was looking for. Easy peasy. Make sure you talk to all the NPCs, get yourself a quick claw. It will sometimes allow one of your Pokemon to attack first. So let's go ahead and see which one of our Pokemon is currently the slowest. I'm not entirely sure who it's going to be. They're all pretty close. It looks like... Ooh, speaking of, let's go ahead and discuss this while I'm at it. So, there are certain types of characteristics that Pokemon can have. I don't know exactly how many there are, and I'm not going to get too in-depth with this, but there is a situation here where when you have Pokemon of certain natures, they can have plus or minus in certain stats. Now, obviously, there's a way to min-max this, and there's probably a good way to know which Pokemon is going to have the best affinity and blah, 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 whatever. I'm not going to do that. But I will explain what this looks like. So, in this case... Charlie is a quiet nature. Now, as you can see here, the red up arrow, the up boat, is on special attack, which means that Charlie, by default, will have a higher likelihood of increasing his stat in special attack, and his speed will do the opposite. It'll be less likely to gain points in speed, which is kind of a bit of a bummer, because I do prefer speed. Same thing here with Sharon. So Sharon is going to be a little bit tankier in special defense, less speed. Um, as somebody who really likes speed, I'm noticing a bit of a not great trend here. So, this is awesome. Uh, and it appears as though I actually got really crappy natures for all of my Pokemon, which is fine. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't inherently matter because all of, I mean, the game itself is relatively easy and the difference between you winning and losing a battle probably isn't going to be by the nature. If you're going to competitively battle, then I would say min-max and kind of makes sense, but in our case, we will live without it. But as the sun begins to set in Jubilife City, we bump into Professor Rowan and Dawn with some miscreants, some delinquents, some degens from up north with their bob haircuts. One of the things that I'm kind of disappointed about in this game is that they did a pretty nice job with texturing the hair, but they didn't do anything really with the eyes. 
or with the eyebrows. It kind of just seems like they went with like a very flat 2D sprite or an image, I guess, for the face. And that's kind of disappointing. But anyway, we're being hounded by these hooligans. And encouraged to battle. So Don and I and D Mike, Don and D Mike teaming up to fight the Team Galactic Grunts. This is our first altercation with the enemy team of this game. I actually probably should have healed, but that's okay, I forgot. Anyway, Wormpole is very weak to fire, so this is fine. I think Team Galactic is actually probably one of my favorites in all of Pokemon. Now, obviously, Team Rocket is the OGs, and it's hard to ignore how great they are. But in this game in particular, Team Galactic is great, and they're very silly. And, you know, usually the... I mean, all of these groups are quote-unquote supposed to be terrorism groups, whether it's like eco-terrorism, like in Ruby and Sapphire, whether it's just like good old regular vanilla terrorism like Team Rocket was with like stealing Pokemon and trying to quote-unquote take over the world. Um, the kind of motivations in this game are a little different and I think it's very funny because what Team Galactic is trying to achieve is like physically impossible, which I don't want to spoil that. You'll see what it's going to be down the road, but it is very silly, very nonsensical, very over the top, which all the other ones seem, I mean, in fairness, Ruby and Sapphire did have Magma and Aqua who were trying to physically change the dimensions of the Earth, which they were sort of able to do, but um, yeah, we're not trying to destroy the Earth in most of the Pokemon games. This game is a little different. But anyway, Sharon has leveled up, and in doing so, she has learned Double Team. Double Team is another one of those moves that historically I would not buff my Pokemon, but I really enjoy doing that now because it makes the battles a little bit more interesting, a little bit less, you know, kind of attack, 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 you know, etc. So I like to kind of mix things up a little bit. I think it's fun to do that. And I'm also going to try to swap Pokemon out, and that goes not just for this battle, but for the Let's Play itself. The entire Let's Play will be done in a way that the team will change to a certain extent over time. I'm going to try to keep certain Pokemon in it for the long haul. Like Maybe like Charlie sticks around because he is the starter, etc. And it's blasphemy to take your starter out of a Pokemon game, I believe. I actually think those are part of the rules. So I'll be careful with that. But in general, I'm going to try to keep mixing it up and find a new Pokemon to keep on my team and rotate things around. I'm not going to pay too much attention to stats and natures and EVs and IVs and all that kind of metagame stuff. I'm not going to really do a whole lot with that. But I'm going to try to stick to my Sinnoh only rule and make sure that all my Pokemon kind of get a fair shake. See, and, and like their, their in battle sprites are fantastic, but they're out of, out of battle chibi sprites. The hair is fine, but the facial expressions are just not, not it. A little disappointing. With how much great work they put into the aesthetic of this, you'd think that that would be something they did. Uh-oh, Charlie's evolving. What? And I'm just gonna let this happen. Whenever Pokemon are supposed to evolve, I'm not too, too concerned about when they need to learn a move, and if they can only get it at a certain stage, I don't really care about that. I'm just having a cash run, and Pokemon are gonna evolve when they evolve. Is this what nature intended? So Charlie has turned into a Monferno. Also, that sprite is fantastic. Kind of looks like a baboon. A mandrel, perhaps. And I always, I also think it's funny, like, I like the beginning and end phases of Pokemon, especially if they are three-stage Pokemon. But I also, I love how goofy the tweener sprites look, especially this one. To intimidate attackers, it expands the fire on its tail to make itself appear bigger. And that's cool. I think the entire Chimchar line is great. So let's see, we got Mach Punch. Mach Punch is, I mean, I don't know. I taught Rock Smash to Charlie already and I feel like I'm kind of regretting it. So we'll go ahead and replace Rock Smash and learn Mach Punch instead. Seems like it's a little bit better of a move. Occasionally lowering defense doesn't really seem quite as useful since we have Mach Punch. And realistically speaking, Power Up Punch seems like it's the best of the bunch of the punch, the punch bunch. So I guess it'll just be a move that I default to if I need to get in a quick attack. It's basically quick attack for fighting moves. Pretty neat. So this is our first experience with Team Galactic. And I believe Professor Rowan's specialty is about Pokemon evolution. 
It seems like Team Galactic is up to no good wanting to use this evolution for their nefarious deeds. But we are being praised for our battling skills with our one badge. Clearly we are more than adept at taking over the Pokemon world. Maybe Team Galactic needs to back off because our 10 year old self, we're waiting in the wings. So here we go. I was actually just looking up this today. You know, back in my day, in the Pokemon Red and Blues, evolution was very simple. It was very much a, a level up. It was a stone. It was a trade. But if you go through and play some of the newer Pokemon games, you'll see that some of the ways that Pokemon evolve are kind of ridiculous and kind of hard to follow. And some of the ways that they evolve, older Pokemon have retroactively had the ways that they evolve change. So we'll see how that goes. There might be some Pokemon that require trades in this game that I might have to do, and we'll see what that's all about later. So here we're being confronted by this girl in her short shorts and macaroni and cheese hair. She uh, is very thankful for our presence. And BB here, she's the system administrator, so she is uh, she's kind of breaking the gender stereotypes of employment and she's embarking in IT, good for her. Now we can access the Pokemon box, the PC, and she has shared her balls with us. See, that's one of the things I appreciate about these Pokemon games and I feel like it really speaks to me as a person is how willing people are in this universe to share their balls. And she's encouraging us to have a bit of an aesthetic with our balls. We can put stickers all over them. So that's fantastic. And we are going to look very pretty. This is not a new thing to Brilliant Diamond and Shining Pearl. This was introduced in Diamond and Pearl just as seals, but they've changed them up to stickers. And BB wants us to, <laughs> hey BB, um, she wants us to, you know, come and see her when we're in Hearth Home City for some contests. Now I'm kind of on the fence about contests. I don't, I did not love them in any capacity when I played kind of Ruby and Sapphire and Emerald. Wasn't a huge fan. I feel like it's just kind of a, it's something you can do. That's what it feels like to me. It feels very tacked on, just like a thing you do. And I'm just not a huge fan of it. I know some people really enjoy it, but it just kind of feels like a Pokemon game within a Pokemon game. And this in its current format is already great. So I'm not entirely sure that I want to kind of try to fix what's not broken and do all that. So I might just give it a little peek so that way you can see what it is, but I'm not going to really spend any substantial amount of time on it. So I apologize. For those of you who may be quite miffed on my lack of interest in the contest. Now I do believe that once you have used the HM move, you should be able to just click the rock, yes. And then the wild Bidoof will swing in and help us out and allow us to grab this item. So we get rock tomb, which is actually a pretty nice item. Now, I'm not entirely sure if TMs are in multiples when you just collect them in the wild. It does not appear to be, so you only get one. So really be choosy about what you think is going to be a good fit. So think about type variety, think about making your move set, have a little bit of coverage, so that way you're not just a, a one trick pony. You don't want to flame out with one move. You don't want to miss the exit to the tunnel the ravaged path can't imagine i would want to have a ravaged path but you never know when in rome we are yeah so there you go it's already telling you that having one type of pokemon is not the best idea somebody might ravage your path if you do that and you don't want that or maybe you do want that once again not judging trying to be inclusive here so before we head into this grass, we have an unavoidable fight. We need to smell some flowers first after we destroy Aroma Lady. What was her name? Tigler? Tigler? That is not a name. Excuse me. In no universe is Tigler a name. Kids these days. 
I remember it being a really funny thing in um, in one of my earlier employments. I had a coworker who was a big fan of a certain series that involved a large metallic chair, and he named his soon-to-be-born daughter after the female, one of the female protagonists of that show, which turns out to be not quite what you'd expect by the end. So that was a bit of a, uh, a whoops. And I heard that that name was actually quite popular around the, the time. So it's an interesting choice. Not sure how I'd feel about that. I typically wouldn't name my spawn after popular culture, but you do what you want to do. I know that certain shows and cartoons and movies have really influenced waves and trends of naming, which I think is really interesting. But I'd like to think I'm a little bit above that high society, if you know what I'm saying. Anyway, so we are poisoned now. Vapidu has an item, or sorry, a, an ability, poison point, that I believe when you cause it to faint or if you hit it with a physical move, that it will poison you as a result. So Sharon was poisoned, but thankfully we do have multiple antidotes, which I'm going to use now because when I play these games, I kind of get into the point where I just go into kind of brute force autopilot where I don't really pay attention to what I'm doing and I kind of just just go for it. So I want to make sure that I'm actually using my items early that the game is so kind in providing for me. Why else are they there? And it looks like we're actually going to have an interesting encounter after this one. I see two small children who need a who need a whooping. And it appears that all these Pokemon here early are looks like some bug types. So here's our first, I believe, glimpse into Krikatot. Maybe the second. I don't know if we saw it. I don't believe we've seen a wild one, but this might be another enemy Pokemon. So Krikatot is interesting. I love the way that it looks. Now I think Krikatot is supposed to be kind of based around it has like a music motif. You can kind of see it's got, it looks like it's wearing almost like a tuxedo with its kind of on its chest and its, uh, its antenna kind of look like maybe like a conductor's wand. Its evolution is even more in depth than selling that kind of motif, which I think is really funny and I really appreciate it. Let's go ahead and bring Sharon back out. I know that Sharon and Steven haven't really had as much screen time, so they're gonna get a little bit more of it in today's episode to have this run be equitable. And once again, things will change. Pokemon will be swapped in and out. I'm gonna try to mix things up a little bit. And if you want to comment on any of the social medias or here in the descriptions below, feel free to suggest what Sinnoh Pokemon maybe you'd like to see and I'll try and factor it in and incorporate it. But no spoilers, please. You can try to stay with the area that we're in. If you want to make a suggestion, I'm going to try to keep things relatively consistent with where I am in the game. So we are whew, tasked with a tall order here to fight some children. Twins live and Liz. They're about to live and learn. And here's our first experience with the Sinnoh Pikachu, Pachirisu, which is a very strange name looking at it. It always made me wonder if Patrisu was one of those Pokemon names that maybe in Japanese it's kind of the same thing. It just doesn't really stick out to me as a name that translates well to English, but who knows. So having our second technical double battle, this time it's, it's our first true double battle that we're in control of both of the Pokemon. As you can see, what's kind of neat in these double battles is you can choose to gang up on one Pokemon. You can attack both of them independently. Sometimes, You'll even have moves that attack the entire field, attacks just the enemies, it really depends. So you have to kind of strategize a little bit. In this case, using Growl from each of the Pachirisus impacts Steven and Sharon at the same time, which is kind of a butt. Now that we have two levels of negative attack, and I'm using two Pokemon that focus primarily on physical attack in the moment, so this is kind of annoying. It's gonna probably cause this battle to last a little bit longer than I'd like to. And in the same way that I'm ganging up on their Pachirisu, they're ganging up on Sharon. So... There are certain ways to bang and gangs, and I don't like that. But 
This battle has allowed Steven and Sharon to both level up, which is fantastic. They're caught up now. I'm gonna go ahead and swap out for Bart and Charlie just to give a little bit more variety to what we're doing. I think that's more fun. Normally when I would play these games, I would just, like I said, go on autopilot, kind of not really pay a lot of attention to the nuance, I guess, of Pokemon. But I think that it's a lot of fun, at least when I'm doing Let's Plays, is I'm trying to actively show off the game itself. So that I think that's the difference between a good Let's Play and a bad Let's Play. I've seen plenty of Let's Plays, like I mentioned before, of people that are probably a little bit more notable. And their goal when playing the games is literally just to pound through them, start to finish, basically play only AAA titles. They're only playing like the top games at the time because they just want views. And a lot of people do like to watch the new stuff, which is fine, which is fair. I think that you should watch whatever you want. But I think that making content as somebody who does that for a living professionally, there should be a little bit more nuance to it. Here's our first look at Mock Punch, which is very good. It's very quick. Knocks Pachirisu out in one shot. Easy peasy. But yeah, making content should be a bit of a craft. It's a bit of an art form. I think that there is some love and care that should go into what you make. And while I do think that you should play and exhibit whatever you want, art is subjective. But I think that the whole point of content creation is to make stuff that people want to watch. Now, maybe stuff that people want to watch is literally just seeing somebody play something. But I think that Let's Playing in itself is a bit of an art form. As much as Sharon evolving to a Staravia is an art form. I love these tweener kind of Pokemon sprites. This almost looks like a the top of a soft serve ice cream cone on its head. It's top head feathers. I'm sure there's probably a name for that. Sorry, ornithologists. So here we go, Staravia. They fly around forests and fields in search of bug Pokemon, moving together in huge flocks. Now what I think is interesting is that in the very early goings of Pokemon Red and Blue, like the cartoon, I guess it's not Red and Blue cartoon, the Pokemon cartoon, the Kanto cartoon, there's actually footage or animations in that of like a Pidgey or a Spearow, whatever, pulling a worm out of the ground, like a small one that wasn't a Caterpie or a Weedle. And I think that's kind of interesting because it shows that there are non-Pokemon creatures in the Pokemon world. And they are, there's also food that they exhibit in the show that's like not made from Pokemon. So I don't know. I don't know. Are Pokemon sentient enough that you don't eat them or you do eat them? Who knows? But we made it to Floroma Town. It has a really nice soundtrack that I'm going to ignore for a moment as we head into the Pokemon Center. We've got ourselves two freshly evolved Pokemon, which is really nice. It's kind of neat how when you play these games, you wind up with certain moments where like all of your Pokemon are tweeners, all of your Pokemon are brand new, final level of evolution, etc., etc. And I think that that's kind of fun to see how your journey progresses as you go along. So let's pop into these houses and explore Floroma a little bit. This lady looks like she has a Clefairy lady, little girl. I do think it's cute how Pokemon pluck berries. Absolutely. So it's saying yes and agreeing to pluck in the berries. I like when people pluck my berries. Gets you a pluck, it's a move. Let's go ahead and check out what that does. I don't know if I'll wind up using it, but we'll at least give it a peek. And we'll look at Bullet Seed too. So Bullet Seed is kind of like a... Uh, Fury swipes for grass types, and you can teach that. It's a physical grass type move, which is kind of interesting. And then we have Pluck, a flying move. It's a flying attack that pecks the target, and if they have a berry, you take it and you eat it. Seems kind of mean, but also kind of cool. So, Floroma sounds like it was pretty boring and desolate. Turned into a Flower Paradise, those of you plant lovers probably would appreciate this. Let's check out this nerd. And it appears that the Floroma Meadow to the northwest is being blocked by some Team Galactic goons. So berries were brought in this game. They were first introduced in Ruby and Sapphire as kind of a 
alternative way to have items and whatnot. And I think it's kind of fun. You can pick the berries, you can plant the berries, and I'm not sure exactly what the grow cycle is. I think it might be different for some of them, but in doing so, you can gather a bunch and use them to impact your Pokemon in battle as a held item. And in order to grow berries in pretty much any plant, you're gonna need to water them. So thankfully this young woman is gracious enough to give us a spray duck. It's a watering can that looks like a Psyduck. So that's great. So if you talk to these kind ladies in this flower shop, they will give you berries. And if you want to, you can exchange some of your berries that you grow for different stickers to place all over your balls. So that's pretty nice. If you're into that, if you're into having sticky stuff on your balls, do that. But instead, we will do the, the due diligence, the kindness, take a berry, leave a berry, go ahead and plant an orange berry. Go ahead and plant I believe we got the cherry berry from the other one. And we will use our spray duck to sprinkle some water. We'll give it a little squirt squirt. And unfortunately you can't see it from here because we're unable to face the berry spots from the side, but I will show that off eventually. So it seems like those berries are all happy. And we can talk to this camper, I believe. So in this game, there's a prevalence of honey. So we'll learn about that later. And there's a, the Team Galactic goons here blocking the meadow that we were alerted to earlier. <laughs> Apparently they're not fans of flowers. They're deemed not that cool. Not a fan of flowers or bugs. That's okay. That's not for everybody. I understand. So we'll go ahead and check that out next time and see what this Route 205 is all about. So thanks for watching, everybody. I've been D-Mike. This has been Pokemon Brilliant Diamond, and I'll see you next time. Bye.